before we go into the time of, uh, uh, of the word, just want to give you a gear up too. In, the two, in two weeks' time on the 18th of September is our Vision Sunday. And during our Vision Sunday, we hear what God is doing, God has been doing in our church. And of course, God, God is revealing to us what He's going to do in the next few, uh, next few years and the future of Faith Assembly. So join us for the Vision Sunday. Prepare, keep praying for the pastors, praise for the board. And I believe that as we prepare our hearts to, for that service, God will inspire us, God will engage us, God will even empower us in the areas that God has for us in this house. Amen. Amen. Would you join me in prayer as we prepare our hearts for the word of the Lord this morning? Those of you back home, would you bow our heads and just pray? Father, we thank you, God, for the word of the Lord. We thank you, God, that this morning you are going to inspire dreams, Lord. God, that you are going to encourage, Lord. You're going to revive things that have been spoken because, God, that you are the dream giver. And, God, that you never forget what you've said. You never forget what you've spoken and you are faithful and true. God, that's who you are, Lord. That's your way, Lord. And we pray today, God, that you will inspire hearts, Lord that you will ignite visions and dreams once again in this house and in every home that is joining, joining this service this morning. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. Turn to your neighbor, give them a feast, palm, and say, please wake up. It's time for the word of the Lord. A man by the name of Jonathan, which I can't pronounce his surname, wrote a book called The Storytelling Animal. How Stories Make Us Human. It's a book that was written basically to, uh, to push the agenda of Darwinism, but somehow it, it fails. But in the book, there was a particular research that was done about human beings and how human beings are people who are storytellers. In our minds and in our, in our life, it's stories after stories that's unfolding. Okay? And what happened was that with clever scientific studies, what happened is that they use beepers and diaries. They kind of find out that on an average, most of us dream or daydream 2,000 times a day. Turn to your neighbor, please. Please don't daydream now. Okay. It takes, and, in the, and every daydreams will, will, on the average, last for about 14 seconds. 14 seconds. That's how long a daydream or a dream is going through your mind you know, might take. 14 seconds, and we do, to, do it 2,000 times a day. 2,000 times. We clever, you know, scientific beepers and diaries. They kind of find this out. And, and, and he says that when we are waking, they did a calculation that we actually spend half our waking lifetime, lifetime or one third of our life on earth spinning fantasies in our mind. That means we are dreaming all the time. And what's interesting is this, that we dream about a lot of things. We dream about victories. We dream about failures. We dream about horror movies in our head because why we dream about things that never come to pass, but we think that it, that it's so bad that it will become that way. And we keep dreaming and dreaming and dreaming and dreaming. We dream about the most ideal things. And I hope that you're not dreaming about the man or the woman of your dream. Okay, but I want you to know, but the mind is constantly in the mode of dreaming. 14 seconds on average, 2 thousand times in a day. This is what clever research has found. Interestingly, today, I'm not talking about wishful thinking, and I'm not talking about fantasies that are, not, uh, that are meaningless, but I want to talk to you about the God who gives us dreams that will burn our life with passion to all eternity. This morning, I want to talk to you about the God who has a dream for your life. Turn to your neighbor and say, God has a dream for you. See, the Bible is full of people that God has given dreams to. For example, Abraham. In Genesis chapter 12, you hear of how God revealed himself and gave him a dream of, from Abram. He became Abraham, father of nations, or father of, of the nation of Israel. What was interesting is this. He, was, he had no lineage. He had no children. But God prophetically dreamt about his future and gave him a dream of a nation that he would one day become a father. Moses is another story of how God gave him a dream in the midst of running away from all these things. God gave him a dream of freedom for his people. God gave him the possibility of a promised land that was given to him. And he goes into this nation with this word and this promise and this dream from God to bring deliverance into, for, for his people into the land that God promised to him and his people. Joseph is a famous story that we will always go to when we talk about dreams, Genesis chapter 37 verse 5 says, And Joseph had a dream. Famous statement. We love that story. You know, how the journey of his dream. And when we talk about dreams, we cannot run away. But read, uh, read about his life of how the dream of, uh, 
possess him and the process of the dream will lead him one day to rule or become the prime minister of Egypt and second to only the pharaoh of the land. You see, a dream is something that captures your heart and your spirit. Just thinking about that dream, it should ignite your imagination, fill you with unquenchable hope and passion. I hope that you have a dream this morning. If you don't, I, will, I pray that at the end of this service, that God will give you a dream. It's something that you can't set aside. It's something that consumes your thinking, fill your excitement and passion. You can, every time, you know, you can apprehend it in a moment, but somehow this dream will captivate you for a lifetime. For a moment of thinking of that dream will captivate you for the thoughts in your thoughts life for years and years to come. These dreams could be experiencing a better life, achieving more incredible things in your life. But the picture that we always want in our dream is of a better future, of a greater future for you and I or for our family. And I want you to know today, this morning, if there's any word that resonates through the century, it's a story about this man called Martin Luther King. Very famous sta statement that he made in Washington, D.C., in a time where discrimination was on high. The blacks and the whites, you know, what, what, the white was discriminating the black. And he had a dream, you know, and this dream was to see uh, equality with, for all Americans, in regardless of what race you come from. And of course, in Capitol Hill, Washington, he stood up and he preached, because he's a Methodist pastor, you know, he preached one of the greatest sermons uh, in, in American history by saying, I have a dream. Today, my question to you is, this, do you have a dream? That story or that word that resonates from Capitol Hill, Washington, still resonates to this day because they still are burning with a dream in America to see equality among the races. T.E. Lawrence says this, All men dream, but not equally. Those who dream by night is the dusty recesses of their mind awake to the day to find it all. It was all vanity. But the dreamers of the day are dangerous men for many act out their dreams with open eyes to make it possible. Pastor, what you just said, basically those who dream at night will wake up that it's all vanity. But those who dream during the day will try to make it happen. And these men and women are dangerous people because they dream to make a difference. See, it takes courage to dream. It takes resilience resilience to see them come true. I like well, this story about a famous person that maybe most, most of you have been to his theme park or have watched any, some of his videos, uh, some of the movies that come from under this brand. It's the brand called Disney. What, what you don't know is Walt Disney had many rejections through his life. And of course, through M Mickey Mouse and a few other animation, he made it. He made it. He started his own. And what happened was that he had an idea or imagination to go to into a place or to create a place to be called the most happiest place in the whole world. I hope that you've been there before because it really feels like the most happiest place in the world, except the one in Hong Kong. Okay. Been to the one, the original one, Anaheim. You know, I went to, when I was 10, I still can remember how I truly enjoy. Truly enjoy Disneyland, especially the churros, because it only is one US dollars and it's this long, and it's the best I've ever eaten. But the idea at the end of the day was this, that when you go into that place, is you are supposed to be happy and not sad because it's the most happiest place in the whole world. It's Disneyland, Disneyland. But before this park was open, see, a few years before the first park was open, the founder passed away, Disney passed away, Mr. Watts passed away. And in the launch of the park, you know, the reporters were giving reports and one of the reporters made a command to the executive that was running the park. He says this, oh, you know, it's too bad that Walt Disney didn't live to see this beautiful theme park. And what's interesting is this, the executive turns to this reporter and replied it this way. He says, oh, he did see it and that's why it is here. I want you to know that's why dreamers who dream during the day is more powerful than those who dream at night. Because they make things happen. 
In the same light, I want you to know that God has a dream for your life. As you read through the scripture, you will find that God dreams about you and I you know, before we were even born. In the light of the Bible, you know, an individual that, that shares this or enforces this truth is a guy called Jeremiah. In the Bible, in Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 5, in the New Living Translation, the Bible says this, that God says to Jeremiah at a young age, He says this to Jeremiah, I knew you before I formed you in your mother's womb. Can you imagine God dreamt of Jeremiah before Jeremiah's parents decided to come together and have a son? Can you imagine? That, is, that, that shows something to me that God has always dreamt of you. God has a plan for you. He dreamt about you and He has a destiny for you and I. He's the dream giver. He formed you in your mother's womb, but He thought about you even before you were formed. Before your mother and father decided, oh, today, you know, this year, maybe because it's this year, oh, let's have a baby. You know, I want you to know, God knew it. God knows it and He wants to form. Not only He formed, but the Bible says this of Jeremiah, before you were born, I set you apart. Many times we think that destinies and calling comes because, you know, you are good in school. But he says, I set you apart. Apart from that is, I appointed you as my prophet to the nation. Here we see separation. Here we see appointment coming from God, even it was in the mother's womb. Interestingly, you know, if you read the life of Jeremiah, he recite this one more time, or God revealed this one more time in Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11. It was to reinforce to the children of Israel, not only that, but to him, the prophet. And God says this, he says, For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They are plans for good, not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope. Again, God reminding Jeremiah, says, Hey, I dream about you. Before you were born. Now that you are born, I'm still dreaming about you. And I'm dreaming about you with all the best plans. With a future, with a hope, a plan. Not to harm you, not to bring disaster into your life, but to at least to prosper you, to see you walk into what you are created to become. We are reminded again of this, that God holds our life. He, is, he holds the world in His hand. He got the whole world in His hands. Not only that, but He got our whole life in His hands if we allowed Him to. God has a dream for every one of you in this room. Turn to your neighbor and say, God has a dream for you. The Word of God shares that He's not only have a dream, but His dream it has a purpose, He has a plan, and He has a position to so bring you into formation and realization of what He created you to become. The problem here is not God. The problem here is us. The problem is us finding what's God's dream for our life. Amen? Because God is the dream maker. He has an ideal or He has a plan from the beginning for you. But the problem is us. We need to realize what we are called to become. We need to realize what's the process of becoming that dream in our life. And that is difficult. There are two things that I understand from Scripture. Whenever God gives us dreams, two forms. He always takes two forms. The first form is this. The first form is always uniquely yours. God has a specific dream for your life. Uniquely yours. Interestingly, if you look in your fingers, you look at your fingers, you realize that your fingers, your thumbprints are different from the na your neighbor's thumbprint. In fact, they found out that re the retina is different between both eyes. Your eyes and your neighbor's eyes. That's the reason why security now uses eyes. Because it's uniquely yours. There's a calling or a dream that God created just for you. But there's also another form of God's dream. And that's a corporate dream. And that's what we're going to talk about in two weeks' time. A corporate dream for the house of God, for an organization, for a, for a group of people, for a family. That's a corporate dream dream that God will put into people, not only uniquely yours, but corporately as a body of Christ. But the question is, at, this, at the end of the day, how does God's dream look like for you and I? Have you ever wondered? I looked through scriptures, I found out there are three things that can kind of tell me how God's dream always looks like. Number one, God's dreams always look, looks like one that needs a lot of faith. You need to believe 
I realize that if the dream is so simple or so easy to, to, do, to do, then it's not God's dream. That's your dream. Because God's dream in the scripture are almost nearly impossible. That's the reason why the prerequisite to pleasing God is the word impossible. In fact, the word Hebrew 11 verse 6 says, Without faith, it's impossible to please God. Impossible. Likewise, when God gives you a dream, it's impossible. That's why you need to believe in God. It's interesting because the scripture shows that, you know, it goes on to say in the same chapter in verse 33 of how people had to believe and trust God because the dream of God was nearly impossible and so daunting that they need to believe and trust in Him to make, to, to, to make it happen or have it happen in their lifetime. Verse 33 of Hebrew chapter 11 says this, Who through faith conquer kingdom, administrated justice, gain what was promised, shut the mouth of lion. And if you read the scriptures, it goes on and on and on about the things that people did because they had faith to believe in the impossible dream that God gave to them. Likewise, if you ask me what, how does the dream of God look like, it looks impossible. It looks impossible. You know, if it's that simple, then God has given you the ability to do it on your, or, or with the grace that He has given you, you can do it. But God's dream is sometimes nearly impossible. That's the reason why he, he pleases Him when you believe and you trust Him and through faith to achieve those dreams. Number two, God's dream always involves Him. If your dream is all about you becoming popular or becoming a star, it's all about you becoming you know, this and that in social media or whatever is about you and not God and not involving God, then it's your dream but not God's dream. Because I want you to know that God dream, God's dream always involves God. Ephesians chapter 30, verse 20 says this in the Living Bible. He says, Now God, now glory to be, glory be to God, who by his mighty power at work within us is able to do. Who do who, who's doing this? Me or God? Able to do far more than we would ever dare to ask or even dream of. Infinitely beyond our highest prayer, desires thoughts or hope. God wants to be involved. And when He is involved, it's always the exceedingly, it's always the abundantly, it's always the greater things because God is not us and us is not God. And when God is involved, you know, He does far more greater things than we could ever do. And He wants to be involved in our dreams. I want to quote a famous quotation, but yet again, a little bit about the story of this man, William Carey. Many years ago, the Baptist Mission Society in, in England refused to do missions. Interesting, they are mission society, but refused to send missionary to India. It was a difficult place. It was a trying place. It was then still not reached by the gospel. There were a lot of wars going on. But yet, yet again, this man had a dream. William Carey had a dream from God to go to India and bring the gospel of God to that place. Cut the whole story short. He bought one, tic one ticket, one way to India. On a boat, a trader's boat, he went, has a family. In five years, he lost his children. His wife went mad. Five years. Only after five years of working in India, that he first saw one conversion, one. If you talk about ROI, that's a bad ROI, okay? You know, one conversion in five years. But this man will like, write many translations. And by the time his translation was finished, it was completed, he was about to disseminate and distribute different versions of the Bible to different group of people because there were many, many languages, local languages. The, the factory got on fire and all his resources was burned away. Works and works that was done through the years, all gone away. And this guy, you would think that he would be very upset, very disappointed. Wife is becoming cuckoo. You know, lost the children in the missions field. One conversion in five years would say this in his book and his diary. Expect great things from God. Attempt great things for God. I want you to know, 
God's dream always involved God. Today, when we think of William Carey, he is called the father of modern-day missions. He pioneered the way for the British missionaries who did not want to leave their comfortable kingdom to, to nations that needed the gospel. He pioneered the way. He was the man, William Carey. Number three, dream. The dreams from God is always transformational. Transformational. I don't want to go any further, but Ephesians chapter 1, verse 11 to verse 12, the last part of the scripture in the Message Bible says, had designed our honor on us for the glorious living, part of overall purpose, He's working out in everything and everyone. Basically, the scripture says in the Message Bible that when God speaks to you or have a dream, it will change you and it will change people around you. Bruce uh, Wilkerson, who wrote the book of Jabez, the, the prayer of Jabez, wrote this, and he says, this, there's nothing the matter with wanting to be comfortable. But he says, but ultimately, dreams are to help someone else. Comfort is to help yourself. I want you to know when God gives you dreams, it's just not about yourself. I realize that God's dream always impact people around us. But the question this morning is this, and I want to emphasize this a little bit this morning is this, how can we receive the dreams of God, since God is the dream giver. How can we receive the dream of God for our life, for our church, if God is the dream giver? I want to give you three points this morning, and I think they are very practical points, but at the same time, I believe God is, gone about, God is about to do something this morning to bring dreams and vision to your life. Number one, if you want to receive God's dream in your life, you need to be or be, be, be in, in God's presence, or being in God's presence. Being in God's presence will release God's dream upon your life. There is no excuse. There is no excuse that you, that you can take dreams from here and there. It's in God's presence that God gives you His dreams. Joel chapter 2, verse 28 says this, and afterward, afterward, huh? afterward, after this, afterward, I will pour out my spirit on all people. We like this because we always like to quote this for revival. But why not quote it for today? It says that your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Please don't dream now. But your young men will see visions. God give young men vision and old men dream. What's the difference? There's no difference. Both are actually visual language that God gives to you and I. He speaks to us. For the older, He gives dreams. For the younger, He gives vision. I thought for a moment, and I went to think a little dif different. You know, I asked God, why vision and why dreams? I realized this, that when I was younger, I tend to, have, I tend to be less negative about my future. I, let, I tend to be more positive about the outlook of my life. You know, I want to do something greater. I want to see something bigger. I want to, you know, uh, I want to attempt something that is, that, that is beyond what I'm able to do on my own. I recap of how I started off as a young boy to want to become a pilot. I watched Top Gun, went into the toilet every morning, locked myself. My grandmother would say, why are you in there so long? Sit on the cockpit of my aeroplane and dream away that one day I will become a pilot. Mm, pilot. See, then one day, it occurs to me that I can't. Partly because those days, people of my race cannot become pilot. Secondly, I had spectacles. Oh, those days, no LAS LASIKs and all this. So I can't. But at the same time, I had another dream. I want to become a football player. So I played football morning, night, every day. I go for training. And my goal was simply this. I want to become a pro. And I want to bring Singapore. Don't laugh. This is before Mao Baltan came up with this vision 2020. It's over. 2020, Singapore will be in the World Cup. When I was young, I dreamt of bringing Singapore into the World Cup. Laugh. <laughs> laugh. Ha, ha, ha. But when I was 15 years old, or 16, about 16, uh, 16 plus, 16 plus, almost 17, I broke into the national youth team. And I was, involved, I mean, I was offered a professional contract. 
by one of the local clubs. A very lucrative one says, would you turn pro? If you sign for my club, even if you go NS, we will wait for you. You know, things like that, you know, and we will, we will wait for you because you're in the national youth team. So we also want you to be part of our team. Blessed with two legs, you know, oh, no, no, two legs, yeah, two legs, yes. Well, a pair of legs, you know, I made it through, you know, I made it through. But somehow before the pro contract came, God spoke to my life. Through a time of prayer, you know, I, if you know, I went through a difficult season with my family and I was locked up at home, but I was praying on my own. As I was praying, God spoke to me. He says, when you are old, or no, when you're old, when you, the, your, your destiny in your life is not to become a football player. That's not my destiny. That's not how He created you to become. He says two words to me. You will lead, you will pastor, and you will preach all over the world. There was two things that He spoke to me. Until today, at 16 years old, you will preach all over the world and you will lead and you will pastor a church. That's it. Ding. Dung. Don't understand, 16 years old, what is pastoring? I just got saved one year ago and now I'm trapped at home. Knife almost on my throat. I mean, knife on my throat. Uh, chased by machete by my dad. In and out of the country, lose a lot of school. Because why? I was being persecuted because of my faith. I realized that 16 years old, Heard that word. Change my vision in life. Less negative. But I was believing, yeah, 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 can, can, can happen. God can happen. Vision. I also realized this, that as you go older, you become very skeptical. You become very critical about a lot of things because you're disappointed partly. You know, you're hurt by people. You're disappointed because everything that has been said never happens. But God say what? The outcome never happen. God say what? God never happen. That's the reason why for young people, they give you vision. Yeah. For old people, dreams. Because why? God needs to help you dream again. Say, hey, you forget. Ah? I told you before. Ah? Like that. Like that. Like that. God wants this for your life. And all of a sudden, he, that dream will ignite the passion and will consume you once again to the destiny that He has called you and I. It's only happened in the presence of God that he releases this. Because Joel says this, that I will pour out my spirit. And then all these things will happen. For God to pour out his spirit, you need to be in a place where you are ready to receive or ready to be in a presence where the spirit of God is moving. I want you to know today, it's a good time. As we worship later on, as we pray, that God's Spirit will be poured out. And you might receive a vision, or you might have your dream reignite once again. Point number two is this, being with God's dreamer. Being with God's dreamer. St story in Samuel chapter 10, verse 10 to verse 11. A story about how Saul, I mean, just let me paraphrase it. Saul was hanging out with the prophets. He hang out with the prophets and the prophets was prophesying and he was not a prophet. Later on, David will become prophet king. But at the end of, you know, at the end of the day, at this point of time, Saul was not called into that ministry. But he was hanging out with a group of prophets. He was hanging out with a group of people that was moving in a certain anointing. And what happened here is this, as he hang out, all of a sudden, Scripture says that he started prophesying. He started prophesying. He started moving in the gifts of God, which he didn't have. You know, interestingly, if you read the Scripture, they were saying like, huh? In verse 11, huh? Is, he, is Saul now a prophet? Is he part of the prophet's group? Or, you know, the prophetic group? They were asking this question because at the end of the day, because he hang out with a group of prophets, the prophet's anointing or the atmosphere began to rub on him. What it tells me is this, in terms of dreams, who you hang out with will slowly rub on you. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 33 tells me this. Paul told the church, do not be deceived. Bad companies ruins good moral. We always do this to, again, our children, right? You know, you cannot make me with bad people. 
in the same principle, I want you to know that if you hang around with, with people who are dreamers, you will start to dream yourself. You will start to see vision yourself. They say that the bird of the same feather tend to flock together. Worry always have this bad connotation, right? But in the positive side, if you hang around with people of a certain feather, okay, what will happen is this, at the end of the day, it will affect you and it will impact you. I realized this, you know, that when I was young, I had a privilege who have a spiritual dad who will bring me to a table. I sit down on the table and on the table, just quietly sitting down, just listening, on the table will be people who are who's who in the kingdom of God at that point of time, like dry hard and things. They will all be on the table. They will all be talking. They will all be talking. And I'm just the little boy that my dad will bring me, my spiritual dad will bring me and sit down. All he wanted me to do was this, listen. Hear. And as I hear how this general of the faith talk about the kingdom, the future of the kingdom, what God is doing in the nation. And all of a sudden, it begins to rub on me because he starts to change the way I think, starts the way I feel, and starts the way I do things. Atmosphere and anointing will affect you. It will. It will. You sit under a negative anointing, it will affect you. You sit under an anointing that is full of faith and possibility, it will affect you. And here, I want you to know, if you want to be a dreamer for God, you need to hang out with dreamers. Point number three, I realize that being in God's service, being in God's service will help you discover your dreams. I started off as a janitor. I told the young people, I started off as a janitor. Janitor. Before I became a pastor and then preacher, you know, I was a janitor. When I got saved, left home, first job for the church, first job, clean toilet, clean toilet. That's all I had. That was my first job, janitor. Graduate for first Bible studies group was Tongling. Came back and I was employed for a season before NS as a janitor of another church. I was a janitor. Can't study, not because I cannot study, but I left home and I cannot finish my education. Could not afford to pay for computer science degree or a diploma that I was supposed to be enrolled in a polytechnic. I could not. I had to leave because on my own and I, have to, I was homeless and I had to pay for my own daily expenses. $3 an hour, working 13 hours a day. Every Wednesday, night, Wednesday afternoon, morning, I'll be in church cleaning all the mess that was left behind over the weekend. Sanitary pads that have been locked into the thing, you know, and it caused the water to flow. Put your hand in and you pull it out. Yes, things that are floating, that are not nice, those are not floating decoration, but really will make you sting. After that, I will go on to do my daily work. Every day for two and a half years of my life, that was, I was, that's something that I was committed and was asked by the church to do. Move all the chairs, be a janitor. I started as a janitor. But as a janitor is where I found my calling. I started to preach to the toilet bowl. I started to talk and, I, and he rehearsed all my sermons in the toilet when nobody is listening. Because nice, the acoustic very nice. In the toilet. And sooner or later, a, a friend of mine, a colleague of mine also joined me. He later became the worship department and I be, went to, become in, uh, to be sent to the youth department. He became a recording artist, just the name of his name, the mention of his name, you will know he's the, the worship leader in Singapore in terms of branding and producer. We were colleagues. He cleaned the toilet, I cleaned this toilet. Together we start. But both of us didn't know where God was leading us. But as we serve, we begin to discover where God has called us. Never do, would, I, would I ever realize this, that one day, a boy who left home, homeless, who have no education, then only O-level, would now hold a doctorate and be, have a title of a doctor. I don't know. Don't know. Never planned it out. All I wanted was a bachelor, that's it. 
ever in my life. That's all my planning. But what I'm trying to say is this. All you need to do is to serve and you will discover God's plan for your life. It might not start or it might not look like the right start, but trust me, His process is greater than your thoughts and your imagination. He will bring you there. First Samuel chapter 3, verse 19, verse 21. The Bible says, As Samuel grew up, the Lord was with him. Everything Samuel said proved to be reliable. Who said this? Proved to be reliable means he needed approval. He was reliable. He had gone through an audit by somebody, maybe by God, God, and it was found out that he's reliable, trustworthy, a proof. And what's interesting here is verse 20, and all of Israel, the dens in the north of Bathsheba and in the south, Samuel was confirmed as a prophet of the Lord. Who confirmed this? The north and the south, everybody recognized this is God's prophet. This is God's man. He's a reliable and trustworthy man of God. Verse 21, this is the most powerful part of this scripture. It says here that the Lord continued to appear at Shiloh and gave messages to Samuel there at the tabernacle. What does it mean, Pastor? What it means here is this, because of his faithful serving, not only people approve and recognize him, God constantly uses this man, approve this man, and speak to this man, and reveal to this man things that he wants to do for the nation. That's a privilege. That is a recognition from heaven above. And I want you to know, for you and I, if you want the dream and the vision from God, because He's the giver, we need to learn how to be found in His presence. We need to be one that is constantly hanging out with the right crowd that will help and cultivate and our dreams. And we need to, at the end of our life, be found serving Him because as we serve Him, His dream will slowly unfold in our life and the approval from heaven will come upon you and I. It's interesting, Philippians chapter 1, verse 6 says this, but you and I, Paul encourages the church and told the church, he said, hey church, I want you to remember this, Philippi church, church of Philippines, uh, Philippi, Philippi, Philippians. He said, being confident of this, he's so confident, Paul, that he who began a good work in you, will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. What does it mean, church? Simply, if you don't think that, it's, that whatever that God says has come to pass, be confident of this. He is still working and He will complete it until the day of His coming. This morning, as the musician comes back, I want to ask you and I, When was the last time you dreamed? Or you had a dream or a vision from God and what has happened to those things? What has happened to those things? I pray that in the next few moments, when we begin to worship, the worship thing comes up, that He's in the presence of God as He pours out His Spirit, that you too, but know what God has in store for your life. 16 years old, I'm living a word that was prophesied or spoken to me at 16 years old. I'm living a 16 years old word. I didn't go Bible study. I was, not, I was locked up at home. But in the time of prayer, 16 years old, that's the only thing that God says to me. 16 years old. I'm 42 this year. 16 years old. In a couple of weeks, I'll be 42. Yay! You know, 16 years old. 
That's all God says to me. You will, you will lead and you will preach. You will lead your pastor and you will preach all over the world. 16 years old. I don't know what that means. All I knew is I got no education. I had to clean toilet. I had to work long hours. I have no place to stay. Three months here, three weeks there, people's floor, people's room. Until the day I got married, my wife, and my own home. No home. No money. Just a word. 16 years old. Just a promise. Just a vision. You preach all over the world. Yes. 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 There's a story about a guy called James Irwin. I don't know whether you've heard James Irwin. James Irwin was a young boy. I mean, like many of us. He was, when he was young, every evening, mom and dad will force him to go to sleep. And he refused to. He refused to. Like any child, he would refuse to. Refuse to sleep. Refuse to, to listen, to adhere to what the directive of the parents are. He would take his time. But throughout that whole time, James, or James had this specific habit. You know, it was kind of the parents kind of noticed this in the habit. He would look up in the sky. From the dinner table, he would look up in the sky. He would look at the stars and the galaxies. And he'd look at the star. Refused to sleep. One day, one night, mom and dad asked James, is James is late? You go, you've got to finish your dinner. Go in your room. Went into the room and hours later, mom kind of suspect that, that James wasn't asleep. Went into the room and saw James looking up in the sky, the galaxy, scoop in the sky through the window of his bed. I mean, from the bed of his window, you know, just seeing uh, the, the moon, the stars. For an hour, the mom stood there and just observing this young man, this young kid, looking up in the skies, just looking up. If most parents, you either will become very reactive and say, Hey, go and sleep lah! That's Asian parents. Yes. Or uh, some of us say, You don't have to sleep. You know, I make you do something. Okay? And other Asian parents practice. But they were Westerners, so they don't do those things. And he just observed. Observe. About an hour, mom went to, the, to James. He says, James, go to sleep. It's way, way too late now. Reluctantly, he closed his eyes and went to sleep. And that before he went to sleep, he had a conversation with his mom. Because his mom asked, what are you looking at? Aliens? Are you like, what are you looking at? Stars? What are you looking at, James? What are you looking at? He says, mom, I want you to know, mom, one day, I'll step on that moon. I'll walk on that moon. Mom, I will walk on that moon. And he went to sleep. 32 years later, after going through one of the most devastating accidents, almost took his life, he broke every bone in his body in a fatal accident, motorcycle accident. 32 years later, James Irwin was one of the chore people ever in humankind or human race that ever stepped on the moon. On the moon. One of chore people in the whole wide world that ever stepped on that moon. That young boy will look up the sky and says, Mom, one day I walk on the moon. One day I will walk there. It tells me something. Dreams are powerful. Dreams are transformational. Dreams motivate us to a purpose and a cause. Dreams will not only change your life, but walking on the moon changed everybody's life in the whole world that is possible. He broke the limit of what man used to say that is impossible. Today, this morning, in this place, in the presence of God, may I ask you this question?
Do you have a dream that God has given to you because of time, because of criticism, because of the, you have put it aside. Put it aside, put it aside, put it aside. But today, I want you to know when the Spirit of God comes, He wants to give you dreams. He wants to revive those dreams. Dream again. And for young, those of us who have never had a dream, today, God wants to pour out His Spirit and He wants to give us vision. Let me tell you this. There's specific vision into your life, but there's also specific vision for the house of God. Would you stand with me as we welcome God's presence in this room, as we ask God to walk into this room? Because when we, He walk into a room, everything changes. Anything can happen. Your life will be transformed. Your vision might change. Your passion might be ignited as you walk into this room. Would you close your eyes and worship God? Lift up your hands wherever you are. Worship leader.